town hall meeting. Uh, as we all know, overdose is one of the leading causes of death in the United States. And opioid epidemic is on the rise, and it's certainly heading home. So um, no community is immune to this. My name is Hanan Scott. I'm an anchor and a host for MEA TV. And as you may know, uh, MEA has been served in the community for the last 25 years and it's been, it's been building bridges uh, between communities. Tonight's init initiative is to address the overdose crisis, uh, to spread awareness, and this initiative also is a step to reach the community and encourage parents to talk to their kids about drugs. <coughs> and hopefully we can be the bridge to our community and to stand together to fight this epidemic. Tonight, uh, actually, we have a great panelist who are ready to answer all your questions, and uh, they're sharing their information, their knowledge, uh, and research in, about what's been done, the science, and how and where to get help, and definitely ready to answer your questions. So, I'd like to start with uh, Dr. Patricia Deloof, uh, Chief Medical Officer. Thank you. As mentioned, I'm uh, the Chief Medical Officer at United Healthcare. Thanks so much for having me here tonight. I, before I actually get into the meat of my pre presentation, I just wanted to share with you, if I may, a few uh, statistics or data as it relates to the opioid crisis and epidemic. This is just such a terrifying crisis right now that we're experiencing, and we really need to get the word out about what um, makes for appropriate opioid use. So if we look at some of the prevalence or the, the rates, since about 2008, the, the number one cause of accidental death is actually related to opioid addiction. This surpassed motor vehicle accidents, which were at one time ranked number one in regards to the leading cause of accidental death in the United States. If we break this down and look at this a little bit more closely, who, who is most commonly affected? Well, we've seen that more commonly males, by a factor of approximately two, two to one, have higher rates of opioid deaths than women. Also, those who are aged 45 to 49 are more commonly affected. So what's the problem? The problem is, is that approximately 4.5 million Americans suffer from opioid addiction due to prescription drugs. Of that, over 500,000 Americans have a substance abuse disorder related to heroin abuse. Of those people who have heroin use or substance use, 23% of them will go on to develop an addiction. So these, these statistics are pretty alarming and pretty terrifying, and that's why the event is here tonight, to create more awareness around this and what we can do. For tonight, some of the goals or takeaway points that I'd like to share is that I'd like for you to further understand more about what opioids are, factors that may contribute to opioid misuse, as well as signs of addiction, and how to help those who might be struggling with opioid addiction. And then also, questions that you might want to ask your doctor before being prescribed an opioid medicine. Believe it or not, our body actually produces its own opioids, called endorphins. Those endorphins are released under certain conditions, such as intense exercise, or even when we socialize with each other, or sometimes even when we eat. And what those endorphins do is that they act on what are called receptors on the cell, which create effects for us. The effects of feeling really good, calm, can cause problems with depression of our breathing or our respiratory system, and then more commonly, as you're aware, it can cause um, pain relief. So 
um, opioids are present within our body naturally. When we look at opioids as it relates to prescription medicines or illicit drugs, they act on those same receptors or those same cells in our body or in our brain and cause those same effects. But the, the effects are actually intensified because they're so potent and create problems as it relates to addiction. I'm not going to go into too much in regards to what medications are opioids. I think Ronnie might share some of that information with us tonight. Just to briefly mention, some of the more commonly prescribed opioid medications include hydrocodone, Oxycontin, Percocet, Vicodin, morphine, codeine, which can be found in a lot of prescriptive cough medicines, uh, fentanyl, fentanyl, um, which is a very potent, potent medicine, approximately 30 to 50 times more potent than heroin, um, often used at the time of surgery for anesthesia. So what is addiction? Addiction, basically, the way that I like to think of it is, is that it's a chronic disease. It affects our brain. It affects those areas in the brain that are responsible for memory, for motivation, for reward. And because it affects the brain, the effects are so long-term, which makes it so hard to treat addiction. Some of the things that one may see or in regards to addiction includes the inability to abstain from opioid medications. There are also loss of behavioral control. So there's a lot of impulsive behaviors when one is addicted. The other thing that is commonly seen is that there's a craving or a hunger for the medication or for the substance, the illicit substance. <laughs> Lastly, one can also see a diminished recognition in significant relationships and our behaviors toward other people. So addiction is a, is a chronic condition that affects the circuitry in our brain, which makes it so hard to treat because the effects are long term. What about withdrawal? Does anyone know in regards to withdrawal what one might experience? Has anyone ever seen that? Yes. Um, I actually had a patient yesterday um, was experiencing withdrawal symptoms. And I learned a lot in nursery school like, about it too. So like fever, agitation, really high body temperature, like can't focus, and they lose like that sense of reality. Exactly. Yes, thank you for sharing. I really appreciate that. So I kind of liken it to having a really bad flu. So if you've ever had a bad flu, you know, you know what that feels like. That's what it feels like to go through withdrawal. And usually withdrawal can occur within about 72 hours of not having the substance or the use of heroin. Um, then within about a, a week's period, um, some of the physical symptoms start to lessen. However, one may still experience a lot of anxiety, sleeplessness, um, a lot of agitation. Then within about two weeks of withdrawing from the opioid, one can start to see some psychological ramifications, so depression, anxiety, sleeplessness. And then about a month after last use of opioid or substance, um, illicit substance use, one starts to see those cravings that I previously discussed of really wanting the medication or the drug. So this is why it's so difficult, again, to treat addiction. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, is yeah. That I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, and these symptoms of craving and behavioral issues can last for years. You can actually go through periods where one relapses despite being in remission for a long period of time. What are some of the health effects of opioids? 
Well, we briefly mentioned addiction, but I really want to stress the most significant health risk for opioids is overdose and death. Okay, so this is why this is so critical. Other commonly experienced health effects include things such as constipation, a lot of gastrointestinal symptoms, nausea, diarrhea. You can also have seizures. You can have bad infections that can occur, such as HIV, AIDS, hepatitis. With the sharing of needles, that brings forth the risk of um, bacteria in the blood that then can seed your heart and seed your heart valves where you end up with damage to your heart valves, a condition called endocarditis. So there are numerous health risks associated with these medications. Does anyone know where a lot of people get things um, opioids from? Pharmacy. 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 Pharmacy, exactly. These are mostly prescribed by physicians, and um, I'm sure Ronnie will speak to this too. He's been involved at the state level as it relates to um, you know legal things that are now coming down the pipe as it relates for physicians. But you know, physicians have been the major culprit of overprescribing for many years. And there are new laws that are actually coming to um, um, vote right now in regards to June, in regards to prescribing patterns and um, looking into MAPS reports to see where the patient's getting medicines and, and so forth that I think will definitely help us in the long run. So as previously stated, a lot of these medications are through prescriptions that are given by physicians. But what happens then is that when a patient no longer needs their medicine or doesn't use it, is they actually give it to their friends and family members. So that's where a lot of misuse is coming from. It's not the, the person selling it on the street, but it, it's through those acquaintances. So what, what can we do to help or, or treat addiction? There's various programs, but a lot of them involve a detoxification program that's usually supervised by nurses, physicians, psychiatrists, psychologists to, um, pre, pre, um, to support the patient through these withdrawals that they can go through, and then also help with the long-term effects. Some of these programs can be short programs, inpatient in a hospital, or they can be residential programs where um, people are treated in more of a home-like setting, and that treatment can last for approximately six to 12 months. What has been shown to be more effective and um, in regards to treating addiction long-term is actually the use of certain medications in addition to these therapies and these detox programs in order to help with those withdrawal symptoms. And maybe Ronnie might be mentioning some of those. Um, some of the medications that we use that have been successful in treating withdrawal um, or addiction include medications such as methadone, suboxone, and naltrexone. And if one is in need of any kind of resources as it relates to medication-assisted treatment programs, I'd be happy to supply you with the telephone number for that information. I'm sure a lot of the brochures might have that information as well. And there's an organization called SAMHSA that has opioid treatment programs listed on their website. And lastly, I just wanted to leave you with some thoughts as it relates to questions that you may want to ask your physician before they prescribe an opioid medication for you. And I'll kind of move these into um, first three questions. So, why do I need to take this medicine? Are there other options that will address my pain? How long do I take this medication? So, opioids really aren't the main line or main state of treatment for chronic pain. We use opioid medications more for an acute injury, 
possibly related to trauma or surgery, but then usually they only should be prescribed for about three days. After five to seven days, there's an astronomical increase in regards to potential for addiction. And there are other things out there depending upon what it is that we're treating. Things like Advil, Leave, Tylenol, or other modalities like physical therapy, chiropractic care, um, acupuncture. So these are things that might work um, and be in your best interest as opposed to being prescribed an opioid medication. Fourthly, one other question would be, does this medicine line up with current medical guidelines? There's a lot of evidence-based guidelines out there in regards to what's appropriate treatment, duration of treatment, um, put out by Center for Disease Control, as well as a lot of other specialty organizations. So you want to ask your physician is if this prescribing or this drug is consistent with those guidelines. What are my risks for addiction? Well, there's certain groups of people who are more prone to developing addiction. Those who have underlying mental illness, such as um, depression, anxiety, substance use disorders. People who have had previous traumas, like uh, physical trauma, physical abuse, sexual abuse. There's also a genetic predisposition. So genetics, family history, environment, all play a role in regards to who may be more prone to developing addiction. How does this medicine mix with other medicines I'm taking? So this is where it behooves us to make sure that we tell our physician everything that we're taking, all our medications, whether it be over-the-counter or prescribed medications. There are certain medicines such as benzodiazepines, those are medicines that you may have heard of, such as Valium, Ativan. They're commonly prescribed to treat anxiety. These can interact with opioids and be lethal. Um, alcohol, alcohol should not be uh, ingested when one is on an opioid medication. So keep that in mind as well. And then lastly, what are the expected side effects? And again, we can't predict side effects for everyone because everyone is so individual. But some of the common side effects that we see with opioid medications include those gastrointestinal things we had mentioned previously, nausea, diarrhea, abdominal pain, itching, rash, those things. So I hope I imparted a little bit of wisdom for you to take for future reference and um, Good evening, everybody. Uh, my presentation usually lasts an hour and a half, and I have 10 minutes, so we're going to go fast, but I'm going to get a lot of information in. So keep this in mind. 115 people die every day in the United States from opioid overdoses. That is a shocking number. Here's a thing that's really different about opioids and other things. When we talk about car accidents, gun violence, at one point, those all capped off. They reached a maximum. The problem with opioid overdoses is there has not reached a max. Year after year after year, more and more people are dying from overdoses from opioids. So we have a major problem on our hands. I am a pharmacist. I've been practicing in Michigan, not as much in a store, uh, but I've been practicing in Michigan for about 20 years now. Here's a shocking reality too. 75 to 80 percent of people that moved on to heroin, 75 to 80 percent started on prescription painkillers at one point. That is a crazy number. People that go in for acute injuries, at one point, 75 to 80 percent of people that moved on to heroin started on prescription painkillers. And we cannot ignore that fact. Here's the thing. This opioid epidemic has drastically changed just in the past year. And I'm, I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. Because of the fact that it was people that started on prescription drugs, then eventually moved on to heroin. Guess what's happening to those people? They're moving on to heroin and not knowing that heroin is being laced with more powerful opioid drugs such as fentanyl and its analogs, certain ones like carfentanil. Unbelievable. So a lot of people don't realize this. The doctor talked about those receptors. They're great pain drugs. But here's the problem with opioids. People don't know how they're dying from opioids. Those same receptors that are used to relieve pain are the same receptors that also regulate breathing. 
So people don't realize that. Those same receptors that help with pain also regulate breathing. So when people overdose with these type of drugs, people don't realize they stop breathing. That's how people die from these drugs. So when someone goes in and they use heroin, not knowing it's being laced with these powerful opioid drugs such as fentanyl, they stop breathing. The brain starts to die in three to five minutes. And that is why it is so important to educate people on what's happening. There's been a huge skyrocketing of deaths because of fentanyl and things like that. In Michigan, we rank 15th in the nation in overall uh, drug overdoses, but it keeps going up and up. But here's the other thing, that states around us are much worse. Uh, Ohio is one of the leading nations in, uh, in the country in overall uh, drug overdoses. So we gotta be very careful what's happening. We are here in Troy. There is not one community that is not impacted from this issue. Whether you're in West Bloomfield, whether you're in Detroit, whether you're up north, whether you're in California or Florida, every single community is impacted by this horrible epidemic. Again, we mentioned these are wonderful pain drugs. People like how they make them feel. But again, eventually, the brain changes. People don't realize how hard it is to get off these drugs once someone is addicted. The brain changes, and it's a healing process that happens. For you and I that are not addicted, we say, why don't people just quit? It is not that easy because a person can become a whole new individual. And we have to be very, very understanding of that through that change in brain chemistry. Here's another crazy statistic, that we consume literally 80% of the world opioids in America. 80% of the world opioids are consumed in the United States. There are some common drugs that are prescribed. How many of you ever heard of Vicodin? Or Norco, very common drugs. The active ingredient is hydrocodone. Well, here's another crazy statistic. Literally 98% of the world hydrocodone is used in the United States. That is another crazy statistic. Here's the thing that I always talk about during my presentations. This didn't start a year ago. It didn't start five years ago. This issue with opioids addiction didn't start 10 years ago. It started many, many years ago. There was root causes. We can get into all that later on, but I, I don't want to get into the details of that. But we have a problem that we have to address. And you know what I've concluded through all this? Through all the talks that I've given, there's only one way out of this. And here it is. That we can throw all the money at this issue, we can throw all the laws at this issue, but we have to stop people from getting addicted in the first place. That is my goal. Right? I'm all for helping people once they become addicted. That's fine. But we have to educate people to stop them from reaching addiction in the first place. So here's a recommendation as a pharmacist. I always tell people, avoid opioids when you can and use them with caution when you have to. That is a key thing to remember. There's a lot of laws that are kicking in very soon. June 1st, we're requiring all doctors in Michigan to be registered for a registry called MAPS. How many of you have ever heard of MAPS, the healthcare professionals in this room? What MAPS is, is if a patient goes to one doctor and then goes to another, they can dial into a computer program and look up to see if they've been to another doctor for uh, the same type of drug. That is a powerful thing. Currently in Michigan, only 31% of prescribers were registered for MAPS. That's a problem. We have this tool now, beginning on June 1st, if a doctor wants to give one of these drugs, they have to be registered for the, the MAP system. That's one. Two, starting July 1st in Michigan, we're also going to limit how many drugs can be written. So July 1st, a doctor can no longer give more than a seven-day supply of an opioid drug. Remember that pathway I talked about? 75 to 80% of people that moved on to heroin at one point started by abusing prescription painkillers. We cannot ignore that pump, right? So here's the thing that we also have to remember as well. There's different things that have happened. How many of you ever heard of a drug called naloxone? Narcan is the common brand name. So we also made Narcan available like over the counter. So if you know somebody, a family member, a friend, a relative that's at risk, how do people die from opioid overdoses? Who can tell me? I just mentioned it. 
government. They stop breathing, right? You can walk up to any pharmacist in the state of Michigan now and say, you know what? I have a cousin down the street that I'm worried about. I want to get Narcan just to have it on hand. Guess what? You're able to get it now in the state of Michigan as long as the pharmacist is trained and they are registered to be able to give it like that in the state of Michigan. That's a huge, huge win. Because here's what happens. Remember, if somebody overdoses with an opioid drug, in three to five minutes, the brain starts to die because of a lack of oxygen. If you have this on hand, you can give it right to that person and it can reverse the effect of that opioid, allowing them to breathe and allowing them to save their life. There's three guarantees that I always tell people. If you eventually become addicted and you don't treat that opioid addiction, the person will eventually overdose, they will eventually die if it's not addressed, or they will go to jail. That is a crazy reality. And it is a stigma within the Chaldean community and many communities. You need to fight for your loved one. If you know somebody has a problem, it takes everybody around you to support that person to save their life. There is hope. Because remember what I said, the brain changes. That brain chemistry has changed. I mean, it takes time for somebody to heal uh, them over time. So here's the other issue that we face in the United States is the fact that we have a lot of different things, a lot of different areas that we gotta pay attention to. Prescription drugs is one thing, right? There's a lot of blame being thrown around. We gotta get past the blame. It's not just the doctors out there. Guess what else? It's us. We have to be aware because guess what? When we have that bottle of drugs that we didn't use and we put it in our medicine cabinet, one of the biggest ways that people get addicted is they go to their grandma's house and they find that bottle in the medicine cabinet and they start using. If you have these drugs in your house and they are no longer needed, you gotta get them out of your house. So there's a couple different things that you can do. One is there's many take back locations throughout the state of Michigan. Almost every police station now, for the most part, will take these drugs back, no questions asked. That's one. Two, the DEA has DEA take back days. Uh, there was one on April 28th, and there's tons and tons of medications that are brought back, no questions asked. There's proper ways of disposing of these drugs, safely disposing of these drugs, to get them out of the home. So it begins with us. If you have a family member that's going in for surgery, you should ask a lot of questions. Because too many times we get that prescription and we don't ask any questions. We just start taking these drugs, leading to addiction. So we have to do our part. I challenge each and every one of you to educate yourself and fight for your family because it is not getting any better. Here's what else I'm seeing right now. We are putting a lot of emphasis on limiting prescription drugs out there. Prescription counts are actually going down since 2012 for prescription opioids. Guess what else I'm seeing in the community starting to rise is heroin. People are, heroin is very cheap. So we're addressing one thing and the other thing is going up. It begins with education. We have to prevent people from getting addicted in the first place. And that is a very, very key thing. So that's pretty much all I have. Uh, if you have questions afterward, uh, there's a lot in this presentation that I don't want to get too much into details with. But I'm hoping you get my point. My passion is to save lives and to prevent people from getting addicted in the first place. Thank you. Uh, I'm Steve Francis, especially in charge for Homeland Security Investigations in Michigan and Ohio. Uh, you know, as, as Ronnie mentioned and the doctor mentioned, you know, this opioid epidemic is, is a game changer for us with the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, the two source countries of these opioids are China, which are just shipping directly through our borders uh, into the United States, and then also Mexico, where a lot of the opioids and fentanyl and heroin is being smuggled along the southwest border. So with Homeland Security Investigations, we're the principal investigative arm of the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, we work obviously with uh, Customs and Border Protection, which are at the ports of entry everywhere. And it's, it's very challenging. Uh, we're dealing with this epidemic that we really haven't ever seen before. You know, I never thought our special agents would be carrying Narcan, uh, wearing you know suits and, and running around with, with Narcan. And, one of our, you know, commitments for the long term is working 
really closely with the DEA um, all around the country. I mean, it's the days of seeing, you know, at least for us, you know, your typical cartel, uh, you know, leaders in the communities, it is, has changed with the dark web. Uh, young people buying opioids directly, or fentanyl direct, pure fentanyl, directly from China, right to their homes. Uh, essentially, it's hitting our international mail facilities uh, across the country. We get over a million shipments a day, and it's a really, really, really difficult job for our inspectors to identify opioids in the mail. Um, we do have a lot of proactive, intelligence-driven uh, task forces where we're you know, identifying some of this stuff, but we're only capturing a small amount. And we are starting to kind of work in the cyber realm as well and, and become a lot more familiar with the dark web. Uh, and I guess that's another thing I never thought would exist in, in my career is trying to understand, you know, the Tor network, the dark web, and uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies that are being utilized to purchase these items. And we're, you know, involved in it, but obviously, you know, I think when there's a significant profit to selling drugs, right, especially heroin laced with fentanyl, where a kilo could be up to, you know, 500000 to a million dollars for just one kilo in profit, if it's cut right and distributed. So that, you know, push is going to be there for a long time. And I think Ron mentioned that this epidemic is going nowhere. Uh, I think the CDC just came out with a report talking about, you know, even with strong proactive approaches to it, we're looking at another nine years. We had 46,000 people die in 2016. We had 64,000 people die in 2017. Uh, we don't know the numbers, you know, I think we're, we're probably at pace now in 2018. Uh, I cover Ohio as, as Tim does as well with the DEA. And in one county in 2017, there were 700 overdoses in one county. And it's uh, Hamilton County in, in, in Ohio. So it's ground zero. Um, most of our efforts there, we, you know, we have a lot of programmatic priorities, investigative priorities for uh, Homeland Security investigations. Uh, our agents typically were working, you know, 15% of their work was related to narcotics investigations. We're at 50% and most of our offices in Ohio and, and here as well, about 25% in Michigan. So uh, I don't think this is going anywhere. You know, From an enforcement perspective, uh, we're starting to work a lot closer with all of our partners and uh, specifically you know, with the DEA, which is you know, very challenging for them as well. So I'll leave you with that. Yeah.